you know, it's not important that your work is great. It's important that it's radical. Business of Architecture, episode 354. Hello, and welcome back, Architect Nation. I'm Enoch Sears, and this is the show where you'll discover how to build a practice that fuels your creative and financial success. Our guest today is Lee Skolnick, FAIA. Skolnick runs an award-winning architecture practice based in New York City. The firm, Skolnick Architecture and Design Partnership, is about 30 people strong and has an accomplished portfolio in the museum, cultural, and luxury residential sectors. In today's episode, we discuss how Skolnick has grown the practice to win significant commissions around the world. Lee, welcome to the Business of Architecture podcast. Thank you. It's great to have you here. So, Lee, the Business of Architecture podcast, I started over 10 years ago. And the reason why I started the podcast is because I realized that I, I got architecture. I knew how to be a great architect or what I thought was a great architect, let's say a good architect. Uh, but what I didn't know was anything about the business side, running a firm, managing a firm, uh, how to get clients. And so my experience was that lack of knowledge in those business areas held me back from achieving what I wanted to on the architecture side. And I'm curious if you can identify with that, if you've ever felt that where, how was that for you? Well, I'll tell you a little story. You know, when I was a student at Cooper Union, first of all, I was shocked that I was admitted to Cooper Union. <laughs> but once I got over the, the shock and the, the um, gratitude for being there, you know, I noticed that it, so many of the students were just amazingly gifted. I mean, just so talented. And, and frankly, I felt like I had a lot of catching up to do. And, you know, what I find really interesting looking, look, looking back on it is that um, I don't know what happened to most of them. And mm -hmm. I think the reason for that is that it takes more than just knowing about architecture. And, you know, I had the benefit of growing up in a household where my father was, uh, he was an immigrant to this country, he came over in the 1920s from Russia, started, a, he and my grandfather started a little business. And I, I saw, you know, through my own experience, what being an entrepreneur, what being a business owner was like. And I had absolutely no interest. You know, I, went, <laughs> I, was, I was an artist. My first art was music. And then, you know, I discovered architecture. And I thought that, well, I'd, I'm not really interested in being a businessman. I'm interested in being an architect. I started out on my own. And before I knew it, I had to do everything that a business person has to do. And yeah, how do you feel about that? Well, it just, it just, it, it has to come naturally. And I think what, what I'm getting at with, in terms of my colleagues at Cooper Union is, you have to be able to sell yourself. You have to get work. You have to make that work um, profitable. You have to find organizational strategies. You know, a lot. most architects go and work for firms for a while, and they that's how they learn about the business. And I didn't do that. <laughs> I was very ambitious, and as soon as I got out of school and I had done some apprenticeship, while I was a student, so I was able to take the exam immediately, and I just started out on my own. So I had to learn everything about the business of architecture by doing it. Wow. Not by example. Yeah. So it was this combination of maybe having some innate um, understanding of business through my dad and my family, and then just, you know, crossing every hurdle as, a, as I... Uh, encountered it in terms of what the business of architecture is like. And, you know, I've been practicing for 40 years, and I will not say that I've mastered that, <laughs> that <laughs> aspect of it. I don't know if you, if you can. Um, it just takes so much psychology, philosophy, business acumen, um, as I said, salesmanship, or, or, you know, the ability to uh, get your ideas across and and to get people to have confidence 
yeah, in you, yeah. and that you you can. I mean, you know, we are we're artists, but we're artists in service yes. to clients. Yes. And if the client doesn't feel as though you're the person to fulfill their goals and objectives, or their dreams, or their fantasies, then you're not going to succeed. You know, that's that's really interesting talking about how maybe you maybe it can't be mastered, but there's the idea that business in and of itself is a huge domain. I mean, we know there's people that go to school for that, they get degrees in that, they make their entire career out of just the principles of business. And then we have architecture, which is an entirely domain, perhaps even larger than business in terms of knowledge, experience. I mean, before I think we hit record here, you were kind of telling me that it takes a while to really figure it out in quotes, meaning kind of getting in your groove with the architecture. So it, it's very difficult to be I know very few people who are really, really accomplished business people and artists, not architects, artists slash artists. And it seems to me, Lee, that there's uh, there's a bit of a sort of like oil and water. The artist mind and the business mind are, in a sense, kind of at odds with with each other. That's a common uh, assumption. You know, I I go back to Vitruvius and Alberti and Palladio and Michelangelo, and, you know, when, when I first read the, the theories of architecture dating back to the first recorded theories, at least in the Western civilization, you know, they all made it very clear that to be an architect, not even to be a good architect, just to be an architect, you had to, I hate to use this term because it sounds self-aggrandizing, but in a certain sense you had to be a Renaissance person. You had to be able to master politics, art, science, humanities, um, psychology, I mentioned before. You know, you, you really need to be a student of all these disciplines throughout your career. And the, the role of an architect, which is what I find most gratifying and most challenging uh, in a good way, is... Our job is to synthesize all those things. You don't deal with them individually. You bring them to bear on a situation and use your knowledge and your continuing education in all of these fields in order to do your job better. And there's no reason that um, business shouldn't be one of them. You know, yes, you're right. A lot of people say, oh, you know, I'm an artist. Don't Don't talk to me about money. Don't talk to me about business. But that's, it's kind of shirking part of your responsibility because the fact is you're dealing with other people's money every day. And, yeah. and you know, it's yeah. your responsibility to be, um, to be a good, you know, shepherd uh, of their financial um, situation. So now on the other hand, to be completely transparent, I do have a partner who is the managing partner of our firm. Oh, now the truth comes out, Lee. Why aren't we speaking to that partner? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe you should be. His his name is Paul Alter, and he was a uh, also a student at Cooper Union. And when we first started out together, well, I started out several years before he came in, first as an employee and then uh, became a partner. Um, we hadn't defined our roles. And it was yeah. really over a great deal of time that... Um, I mean, at, at a certain point, for instance, when I turned 50 years old, and I'm now 67, very young 67, I know, but nevertheless, um, you know, I said to myself and to him, I said, you know, I've done everything that there is to do in the practice. Not that I don't want to keep doing it, but, you know, I have I started out paying all the bills and collecting the fees. and I think I have gotten to a point where I can responsibly say, this is what I want to do now for the rest of my career. I want to work with clients directly. I want to do the design work. And I want to be the person who goes out and gets the new work. I said, I think those are the things that I do the best. I've done it all, but I don't necessarily have to do it all because there are lots of things that other people could do as well or better than me. And that's when I, I said to him, you know, I think, you know, you're, he's a talented architect and he's very knowledgeable. Um, 
But I said, you know, I think I would like you to be the managing partner and, and to take responsibility for a lot of the day-to-day -day business. Um, and, you know, what I learned is, first of all, he's very good at that, which is, which is good. But I've learned that you can't shut that piece off anyway. I have to still be responsible for and cognizant of and active with the, the business end of the firm. So, you know, there's, there's Paul, there is our controller who is excellent and really does a lot of the nitty gritty, certainly the bookkeeping and financial planning. And then there's me and we, we act as a, as a triumvirate. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I, you know, that, that idea of, of finding the alignment, finding the alignment of what you really enjoy, what you're good at, how those cross over, and really what you spend your time doing, that can be difficult. It can be difficult identifying exactly what someone wants to do, and maybe even more so identifying what we're not good at or what we don't want to do and, and allowing someone to step into that space. Yeah, well, it's, it's double-edged. I mean, on the one hand, I knew the things that I would just as soon um, mandate to someone else, but on the other hand... I have enough of an interest in this enterprise that I would never tune that out completely. I mean, that, that's just... And, and, and also, you know, Paul and I balance each other out. He's much more conservative than I am. I'm the one who often comes up with, <laughs> you know, ideas for initiatives, strategies, etc. that, you know, take a leap of faith from a financial point of view. And so, you know, we do temper each other in the sense that, I, you know, I'll say, hey, you know, let's, let's start developing a furniture line because I'm very interested in, in that. And, you know, then, you know, we have discussions about, well, you know, what's it going to take to do that? And is this the right time to do that? And do we have the, uh, the uh, capital to invest in something like that? Or the same is true. We do a lot of pro bono work for um, charities and not-for-profits. And, you know, I tend to co to commit the world, you know, I, I just, you know, we'll do this for you. And we, and we do, but we also, you know, we meet and we say, well, you know, let's donate our services up until this point. And then if they decide they want to go ahead, then we'll give them some reduced fee to continue the project or, or, or I will donate my time, but we'll charge for the rest of the staff. So we come up with ways to, you know, I feel very strongly that architects have an obligation beyond their, their business practice to give back to society because we have an expertise that is valuable and, and a lot of people need it and not everyone can afford it. So, you know, we, we try and always strike that balance between, you know, we'll usually have maybe three, three or four pro bono projects going on in addition to, you know, I would say on average, maybe about 20 projects in the office. Yeah, I know a lot of architects feel that same way, Lee, which is the desire to really, really give back to the community. How can we give back to the community, though, if our, if our profitability is down or if we don't have the financial strength to be able to do that? It's really, it's really difficult. Yeah. It, it, you know, they're, they're, they're companies... And, and professionals, you know, I think of lawyers, you know, who are charging $400, $600, $700, $1,500 an hour for their time. You know, architects, if you can, if the, if the founding principle of the firm can bill at $300, $350 an hour, that is at the very high end, not the, perhaps the extreme high end, but for most firms, you know, we're not a big firm. We're, you know, between 20 and 30 people. You know, we, we can't charge any more than that. And, and then, you know, it goes, of course, on a sliding scale down where for junior people, we may be charging $95 an hour. So mm -hmm. to your point, you know, when we do pro bono work, it's coming out of our pocket. It's not just, you know, shaving some cream off the top. It's yeah. literally cutting into time that is not billable. Yeah, yeah. But we do it because 
you know, that's that's our commitment. That's our yeah. those are our val those are our values. Yeah, I get it. How how much would you say that you've tried pushing that upper envelope of what you could charge? You know, you kind of mentioned the three hundred dollar an hour barrier. Well, you know, architects, as we all know, and you, you probably know as an architect, we're our own worst enemies. In the sense that, you know, from a business point of view, constantly undercutting each other, constantly bidding lower in order to get a job. So, you know, we're often considered not often, we're most of the time considered on the high end of, of fee schedules. And it's tough because, you know, we have clients who say, well, you know, I want you, I know I want you, but, you know, you're going to cost me X number of dollars and there's somebody else who's going to do it for, I mean, ridiculously, you know, 50%, 75% lower then we're charging, and you know what can you say? Well, then you should hire them because I'm not going to. Uh, we can't be competitive. I I don't want to pass judgment on their skills or talent, but I have to believe that they're not spending the amount of time that we're going to spend on your project. Because if they can charge that kind of low a fee, then they're either not able to support themselves, or they just think that they can spit out, you know, solutions. And that's just not what we do. We take our time to do the job really the way it deserves to be done. And that's going to cost a certain amount of money. And we lose we lose a lot of work. I mean, fortunately, we have a reputation that um, often precedes us in the sense that people have already decided that they want to work with us and they're willing to pay the fees. And we're not astronomical. I mean, you know, they're, they're you know, we're not charging what I'm sure that you know, that one one-hundredth of one percent of, you know, the so-called star architects are charging. Um, I know we, and, you know, it's really interesting. We work with, um, at times, with interior designers, and I'm just floored by what they charge yeah. and what they yeah. get away with. Yeah. And, you know, we, we'll struggle to convince a client to use a better quality window, you know, which will cost them X amount of dollars, and then the interior designer comes in with a side table that costs $500,000. Yeah. And it's like, yeah. what? You're, you're, you're not willing to, to use a good quality building material, but you're willing yeah. to spend, you know, half a million dollars on a table? Yeah. It's, and, and, you know, who's, you know, what can you say? What can you maybe, say? Maybe, maybe you should revisit that conversation with Paul about furniture, right? <laughs> <laughs> This could True. be a viable business opportunity. So and and you know we we will on a number of our projects we'll do the interiors, even on some very large mm -hmm. institutional projects, and you know it's a bargain for the client. Yeah. Because for one thing, we don't mark up, we don't you know mark up the the wholesale to retail, we just charge for our time, and so they get a fantastic they get our discount. Mm, yeah, but they're not paying the markup. Yeah, yeah, I mean, killer deal for the client. Yeah, and but and, I mean, what? Do, why do we do it? Because we want to make sure that the project is harmonious, that it's yeah, coherent, it goes all the way through, that everything fits together beautifully. Yeah. yeah. So, since we're on the topic of money now, <laughs> what what is what role in your mind? What role does money play uh, in a in a firm in your firm? Well, I mean, it, it it operates on three levels. One is, you know, we want to be very um, responsible to our staff. So, you know, we, we, we try to make sure that we're compensating them fairly, but also that we're offering them, you know, a lot of architecture firms are not, in a certain sense, they're not real businesses because they don't give people benefits, profit sharing, 401ks, health, um, disability, etc. We give our entire staff all of that. Wow, it's really generous. A hundred percent. Yeah. We just feel like, you know, the, these are professionals. These are people with families. Why should they suffer because they decided to be architects? So, so there's the that's a good question. <laughs> that that's 
that's one aspect of the money. The, the second is my partner and I, you know, we take a draw. We don't take a salary. Okay. So our compensation fluctuates wildly. You know, if we have a good year, you know, then, you know, I think we're compensated fairly. We're not, you know, getting super rich, but, but we're, we're comfortable. But there are times when we, um, we keep the staff salaries at what they, you know, have been, but we take the hit. And so there, there are years where we make much less than we really should. And, you know, at times when, when things are really tough, like the pandemic or some of these downturns, you know, we, we've experienced, you know, in, in the course of the practice, probably three major economic downturns in the economy. And then we, we have had to, at times, reduce people's um, uh, uh, days. You know, we, we went back to four days a week for, for across the board, which we hated to do, but we, we had to do for cost reasons. And, uh, or, or we've kept everybody working, but temporarily reduced their salaries. You know, again, we hate doing that. But, you know, it's so important to us to keep everybody employed. You know, there are also a lot of firms that, you know, just go through this incredible um, upheaval of people leaving and hiring new people. The investment in people's expertise and knowledge of how we do architecture is so valuable that the last thing we want to do is lose someone because inculcating our approach, our values, our process in, an, in a new person is a very long-term proposition. And so anyone who, who we value, we just don't want to lose. And so we try and find ways to be fair, but make sure that we can keep the talent as much as possible. The third aspect of, of money is just the big nut, as, as we call it. Every two weeks and every month, we have to come up with a lot of money just to stay in business. And so, you know, like a, like a lot of firms, we did suffer as a result of the pandemic. We did get a PPP loan, which saved us, you know, because we yeah. got eight weeks of um, salary yeah. that tided us over. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we, did, we didn't shrink the, the staff, which was fantastic. Nobody got laid off, but we did consolidate our office. We had um, a full floor of a, a, an old uh, skyscraper building down in the financial district, and we uh, reduced to half of the floor. And that was a very tough negotiation with the, uh, the landlord, which, by the way, my partner really bore the brunt of. He was fantastic. With you know, we got a lawyer, and we were we we had a lawyer recommended to us who just represents tenants, and he, he's absolutely a shark. We we might need to get his number and give it to some of our listeners. Yeah. There might be a demand for that. Yeah, well then then we should we should get a referral fee from him. There you go. Let's <laughs> let's let's set it up. It's, now we're talking business, <laughs> right? But um, between the, the lawyer and and Paul, my partner we were able to strike a deal where they let us out of the lease on the other half of the floor. And, you know, we'll see how that works out. Everything's a gamble. You know, we, we could find in a couple of months that we were totally, we've run out of space again. Mm. But we had to do something to, as a stopgap measure to balance the books. So that this is what we did. Now, because of COVID, we're only allowing people back into the office in small groups anyway. So it could be that, you know, this remote work situation will probably have long-term impacts on how we practice. And I can imagine, like me, who is working out of Sag Harbor now, um, that a number of our staff will work part-time from home and part-time in the office. And so we won't have the need for as large a space because people will come in in teams 
to work on projects certain days of the week. Mm. That's brilliant. It's going to be interesting to see how that shakes out and how that how that actually comes together. Yeah, you know, I think it's it works pretty well when projects are further along in their development and they're in an implementation that makes sense. Yeah. phase. You know, they're yeah. under construction. Um, you're not doing masses of of drawings. Yeah. You know, you're 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 fielding requests for information. You're you're looking at um, videos or photographs of of construction or you're even going to construction sites on a limited basis and you know you're doing a lot of administration work that is not so hard to do remotely and by zoom and go to what i'm finding as the design principle of the firm is that new projects when they're in the early stages of design it's very very challenging to work as a team on design from remote locations and I'm doing more work than I've done in, in years at a table with my pen mm. doing sketches freehand mm. and then sending them to staff, having them process them on the computer, send them back to me, mark them up, send them back to them. It's very cumbersome and it, and it also is much less collaborative. Mm. I mean, yeah. my, my days in the office before the pandemic, even though I have my own office in our office, I hardly ever set foot in that office except to, to maybe read emails and respond. I was in a conference room all day long and it, it was sort of like being a, a shrink or a dentist or something. People would just come into the conference room. So I would just have one project meeting after another where the teams would come in, we'd work on design together, then they would go off, the next team would come in. And that's how I, I ran the process of, of design. And it was very productive because everybody was around the table. We, we looked at a bunch of issues. We made some, um, you know, we, we came up with some ideas about how to address them. And then they would go back to their desks and work those things up. And that would keep them busy for you know another three days or another week, and then we'd have another meeting. Now it's it's like I say it's it's me at a table, doing drawings, sending them out there, and hoping that what I get back is what I was looking for. Yeah, that sounds like another another so it challenge. Just, it takes it takes a lot longer. Yeah, it, it takes yeah. a lot longer. So we're okay, you know yeah. it's still it's still. Uh, in its infancy, I'm sure things, you know, we all know how to solve problems. Over time, we come up with solutions. Sure. So, I mean, one of the solutions for me, um, and it may not be that applicable to everybody, is, you know, when I was in the office, I also had an assistant, an executive assistant who helped me to organize all the things I have to do because I also write and lecture and do all sorts of other things and trying to organize all of that. I don't have that now. And what we may do is hire someone out here in Sag Harbor who can just help take on those organizational tasks so that I'm not spending my time doing things that someone, you know, at a billing rate, you know, that's, you know, one fifth of mine could, could be doing instead. Yeah, that's not efficient, not efficient at all. Yeah. Well, and you have you have the benefit in the the, the privilege, the blessing of having uh, a division of labor in terms of the leadership of the firm, like you mentioned, having a managing a managing principal who can take care of a lot of the management duties. What would you say from from the business and organizational and the selling side, all that business side, what would you say is the most difficult part that you found about keeping a firm like that running and going? Well, it's controlling our time. It's really, um, mm. as I mentioned before, we tend to spend a tremendous amount of time on projects. And the, the reason for that is that's the way we think they should be done. And we think that our work speaks for itself in the end, in the sense that you can see the care that went into everything down to the last you know, little detail. And not only that the detail works, but that it is a it is a microcosm of the larger 
ideas of the project. So that this sense of everything answering to a, uh, a theme or a concept that is appropriate for the situation, that takes a lot of time. Yeah, it because does. Because you can't just go through a catalog and say, okay, here's a doorknob, here's a hinge, here's a, here's a piece of HVAC equipment. It's like you look at everything through this filter and try and determine what is the, how is, does all this get synthesized into something that is very holistic in the end. And it just takes time. So the management of time, I mean, we have project management meetings every Monday morning. So it's it's Paul and I and uh, Joanne Secor, who is my wife, but also our director of museum services. So all our museum projects she runs and she also takes care of marketing as the marketing director. So we, we meet along with our controller and uh, the project managers in the office, a handful of, you know, six or seven project managers. And all we're always talking about is time management. What are the fees that we have to work with? What is the time we have? What what uh, time uh, modules did we project for the various phases of the project? Yep. And how yep. well are we meeting those expectations? And, you know, we see which projects always take more time. And frankly, they're the cultural projects, the museum mm -hmm. exhibits, the libraries, the schools. Um, and, and, you know, to be perfectly honest, a lot of our other projects wind up paying the shortfall mm -hmm. of those projects that really don't get covered by the available fee. And if we're doing those institutional projects, very often it's a government entity or a foundation or, you know, and... They don't pay high fees. You know, they pay, yeah. in fact, they very often dictate, you know, quite low fees. Why do we do the projects? Because we love doing them. Yeah. But they, they often don't compensate to the, to the um, level that, of the time that we have to devote to them to do them well. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's definitely difficult from a business perspective. I mean, let's say I run a painting business and there's a certain type of clientele that I really enjoy working for and I go and I spend 30% more time doing that even though I'm not getting paid for it. I mean, that money has to come out of somewhere, right? And so exactly. what I hear you is that you have some projects that are more profitable and that they end up paying for the overages and the extra time that you spend because of your, your care about yeah. wanting to make sure those projects are really the best work you guys can produce. Yeah, I hearing? mean, if we can't do that, then, you know, I'll go play guitar in, 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 a, <laughs> in a club. Instead. Well, tell, tell, me, tell me this, Lee. So it's, it, it is difficult to, um, you know, like you said, you guys are taking draws. So you're not, you're not on a salary. Say it fluctuates. I mean, if you don't mind me asking, and feel free to, to pass the question. I mean, are you independently wealthy? Do you, <laughs> do you, have, you live off of a trust fund? Um, New York isn't the cheapest place. How do you make this work? Uh, with a great deal of effort. Okay. Um, no, uh, neither Paul nor I came from, you know, there, there's this, this old tradition uh, where architecture was, a, you know, a gentleman's profession. And it was understood that you were not going to make a lot of money, but you were, as you say, you were living off some other uh, assets or income. Uh, that, that, I mean... You know, I came from a comfortable family, but I wasn't left any money. Um, you know, I was I was given uh, support, you know, th through the time that I was a student, and maybe a few years beyond. You know, when I first got married, but it was not <laughs> major support. It was, you know, a little bit of help. Uh, but no, no, no. We we live off what we we make, and um, and yes, New York is tremendously uh, expensive and you know and it's not purely the pandemic that had us moving out to Sag Harbor because you know we were we were um, supporting you know two complete homes yeah in two expensive areas I mean yeah. the Hamptons is not cheap either yeah and so um, we're sort of taking a breather financially in the sense that we 
reduced our overhead, our personal overhead by probably 30%, I would wow. say, yeah. in moving out of New York. And, you know, frankly, we'll probably get another place in New York after things calm down, but yeah. it will be a lot less expensive than the place we had before. Mm, mm, mm. So, no, you know, I, I mean, architects, you know, people send me their, their kids who think they're interested in architecture. Yeah. And, um, and I, you know, I, they sit down across the desk from me and I ask them, you know, why do you want to be an architect? You know, you sure this is what you want to do? And I, you know, I tell them two things that, that always come up. One is, if you're smart enough to be an architect and can get through school and licensing and everything, you're basically smart enough to do anything. Yeah. So if there's something that you may be interested in as much or almost as much as architecture, if you don't feel like you absolutely have to do architecture, then do something else because it's going to be a lot easier and you're going to make a lot more money. You know, you could you could be in finance, you could be in law, you could, there's so many things you could do with your intelligence that will be more compensatory. That's number one. The second thing is they always say, well, you know, what advice do you have for me? And this doesn't have to do with business, but I, I always say the same thing. Travel. You must travel. You must see the world. You must understand other cultures. You must see all the buildings that you studied and understand why they're important. And you need to, you need to distill down what are the qualities of human existence that are universal. Not what, what divides us, although that's interesting and, you should, and that's a great education as well. But what you need to know as an architect are what are the basic needs of people. And when you travel, you see that there are these parallels that exist everywhere. And it's, I, I feel that it's imperative that you get to that baseline and then build back up from there into individual cultures. You know, we do work around the world. And so often we're, we're you know, get off a plane in Bulgaria or Kuala Lumpur or China and we're going to do a project, and the client has hired us because they want cutting-edge 21st century design. And my first response is, you're going to get that. Don't, you don't have to worry about that. What we're interested in is doing something that's appropriate for your culture. And we're just dropping in out of outer space into your culture. Our first job is to immerse ourselves in your culture and understand how people respond to space, how they respond to material, how they respond to light and detail and social interaction and all these factors because that's what's going to make your project successful. And, and it's very interesting because we get pushback. When we did our first museum in Bulgaria, you know, I, I basically gave this sermon to the client and they said, yeah, th that's fine, that's fine, but we're not that interested in our culture. <laughs> and I said, well, I am. <laughs> and, and, you know, we wound up doing a museum that did both. They got their 21st century building. It got published everywhere. It won all these awards. But the fact is, it's the right building for them. I couldn't have done yeah. it in Florida or Tokyo or Shanghai. It's, it's, it comes out of their culture to serve their culture. And you guys have, as you mentioned, you've done some very impressive commissions and a lot of fun work. I can hear that passion coming through <laughs> in, in this conversation, Lee. What would you say is is the key to the work that you do win? Does it just, the phone just ring and it just come in? Do you do any sort of outbound searching or business development? How do you get your best projects? Um, we get our best projects two ways. One is literally just word of mouth. You've got a tremendous amount of referrals. Yep. Um, yep. And the nice thing about that is that they have very often decided already they want to work with us or they're talking to a very small handful of architects, three yep. or five at the most. And when that happens, I'm pleased to say we more often than not get the project. 
but that's mostly for uh, personal residential projects, some commercial projects. The, the cultural projects are almost often done by um, you know, competition or RFPs. Um, we tend not to respond to um, RFPs that just go out to er the entire world. We, we uh, tend to respond to invited RFPs where they've already, you know, narrowed it down to, again, you know, five firms, three firms, eight firms, something like that. And then, you know, our, our track record, it's like everybody else. I mean, you know, if we get 20% of those, you know, that's pretty good. H happy days. Yeah. Um, but, we, but what we have not really done, we talk about doing it all the time, but we've not really done is gone out, you know, cold calling or cold selling, that sort of thing. I mean, there's an interesting phenomenon which may be of interest to your, your listeners, to some of them at least. And, yeah. You know, I, I started out purely by serendipity working in two realms. One was custom residential and the other was museums. And yeah. I won't go into the long story of how those happened. But what was interesting about them is that they all occupy a certain world. That is, the, the wealthy residential clients that we were doing work for were the same people who were on the boards of major cultural organizations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and so we wound up, very early in my career, I wound up in this sort of band that had a certain synergy and, and interrelationship where they fed each other so that the cultural work and the residential work um, was part of a, an arts and cultural continuum. And uh, that served us very, very well. I get that. I get that. Now, Lee, let's let's just pretend for a minute that I am. I come to you as a, you know. You said a lot of people come to you for advice. Let's imagine that I'm a young firm. Uh, let's say we've been in business for five years. We're, we're like you in terms that we're very design focused. We want to do the best work, and we want to do it even at the expense of the money. So we're willing to put in more more work than we're getting paid for because we want to make sure the project is right that it's right for the client, that it represents what we want. But what we found is that uh, we're not making money. Uh, we find that clients are still seeing us as expensive and we're, we're working all the time and the projects we're getting, we don't really feel like they're representative of what we could really do. We feel like we're kind of getting small, you know, piddly projects and we're trying to turn them into masterpieces, but they don't really, they don't really <laughs> merit it. <laughs> right. what, what advice would you give me? Well, I think there are a number of paths you can take. I mean, one is supplement your income by doing something related to architecture. For instance, teaching. If you can get a teaching position, you know, it's often enough to uh, help pay for your basic needs while you're spending nights and weekends, you know, pursuing your, your art or your craft. Um, you know, the other thing is, you know, take on some projects which may not be your ideal projects, but will help to pay the bills. So don't stop pursuing the, the projects you really are passionate about, but find some way to do some work that um, is, I don't want to call it grunt work, but it's work that needs to be done and that you're, you have the skills to do. Um, the other thing, which is easier said than done, is, is be entrepreneurial. You know, find things to do. You know, like, I, I know architects who, in their spare time, have been designing, like, designer dog houses and put them out on social media and supplement their income because they get, you know, every once in a while, somebody will pay them a few thousand dollars, you know, for a design. So, you know, what, what skills do you have that could be actually um, uh, made operative and be fun, but, but give you, you know, an added kind of income that doesn't require a client to hire you to do a design project. Yep. But, you know, there, there's no, I mean, I certainly don't have any magic answer, but I think it 
being entrepreneurial, all of those things in a sense are entrepreneurial, yeah. even teaching. I mean, yeah. think about what skills, expertise, and qualifications do you have and how could you put them to use in some way? Um, I mean, the last, if you're really passionate, it would be a shame to, to give that up unless you really have no choice. Because in most cases, if, you, if the talent is there and the passion is there, it will come to fruition at some point. It just may take a while. I mean, yeah. I, I look at colleagues of mine like Liz Diller and Rick Scafidio. You know, Liz was in my class at Cooper. Rick was our professor. My first year out of Cooper, the three of us worked together. And I actually left, well, for two reasons. One was because I knew it was going to be Liz and Rick. It wasn't going to be Liz and Rick and Lee. Mm. But also because, you know, they had the, the guts and the, and the discipline to take on anything they could and not compromise their, their standards in terms of what they wanted to do. And they spent 20 years doing practically no built projects. You know, they taught, yep. they did uh, museum exhibits, they did performance pieces, they wrote books, they lectured, they managed to, to keep going. And it paid off enormously yeah. because now they're, you know, right up there in the top handful of, of firms doing spectacular work. Yeah. So, yep. you know, they, they, they stuck to their guns and they had the, the passion and the, and the discipline to keep going at it. And, you know, I, I, I'm very impressed by that. Yeah, it is. So let's let's say that we we take that advice and we're able to find something that actually supplements the income. So now we're sur we're surviving. We can pay our bills instead of being under constant stress all the time. How do we then start to get uh, move into another sphere of work? Would you say based upon your experience, up leveling the kind of projects and clients we work with? Well, you know, it's interesting. Early in my career, I did a project, and I this was fortunate. The client was for. It was fortunate that I had this client because she was a design editor for yeah. the New York Times and, and ultimately became editor wow. in chief of some design magazines. But she hired, I, I had done some work for some artists and she learned about that work and she and her husband were very, very design conscious. And they hired me to do a house out here in Bridgehampton. Yep. And it was very, um, Radical, and it, it became a record house, an architectural record. And I had a photographer friend, and it got published everywhere. It was yeah. in books, it was in magazines. And I had a photographer friend who said, and <laughs> you have to take this in the spirit I'm giving it. He said, you know, it's not important that your work is great. It's important that it's radical. And I didn't go into this project thinking that I had to design something radical. It's just the solution I came up with. But I do notice that the projects that are the most unconventional get the most attention yeah. in the press. Yeah. And that is a rung on the ladder of getting noticed and then getting more um, inquiries, which doesn't mean that you're going to be the architect for everyone because not everyone wants something that's really out of the box. But the people who do tend to be clients that, you know, can help your career. I mean, look, you have to differentiate yourself and it's harder, harder now than it's ever been because people are throwing designs onto the internet that don't even have clients. They don't have, you know, they're just, I mean, look at all these, these, um, these websites now, I mean, there's just a million of them and they need content every single day. Yep. Yeah. And so they're just throwing stuff on there. And I, you know, I have to say, I don't want to sound like an old guy, but to, to some degree to the detriment of architecture, mm. because, you know, the computer has allowed us to create these visions that have no um, relation to reality, but they're just shapes. Mm. And I don't know what necessarily what in many cases what problem they're solving, other than showing that 
I can manipulate this computer program to create the shape that you've never seen before. Yeah. And that's yeah. not architecture, but it does get a lot of notoriety and you do see it trickling down into um into projects. You know, I, I there there's so many buildings, museums and other kinds of buildings being done in places like China that are just literally cartoons. I mean, yeah. somebody came up with, you know, and all of a sudden it's a building. God knows if it functions. God knows how it's going to last and stand the test of time. Um, but, you know, people are, are uh, seduced mm. by these things. So, so it, you know, it is a double, you know, another double-edged sword. On the one hand, I'm saying be adventurous, but don't be stupid. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great place to end today. Now, Lee, if people, uh, a little interesting tidbit, people can also tune into your radio show if they wanted to. Is they that can. right? Yes, it's, it's called The Originals. It's on a local radio station here called WLNG FM. It's a 92.1, but they do live stream. So you can go on WLNG.com and you can listen to shows live. They also archive the shows, so you yeah. can go yeah. scroll down and find past shows. And, and it's usually, is it usually music? Is it music, live performances? What What's generally the, it's, the topic? It's music. It, it, it's all yeah. about bringing on singer-songwriters, yeah. Origi yeah. original singer-songwriters. And I've had, you know, lots of people who are unknown, but I've also had uh, Jimmy Buffett. I've had G. E. Smith, who was the yeah. leader of the Saturday Night Live band. Yeah. Um, so it's a whole mix of people, and it's it's fun. It's a lot Very of and fun. I, Very and I fun. play some of my own music as well. That's great. Well, Lee, you did mention you did make the comment about the Renaissance man earlier, and we can tell I've picked up through this conversation that that is that if I had to label you somehow, now it'd probably be really hard because you don't fit into any box. But Renaissance man would be. That'd be a pretty close, close one. Well, if that winds up on my tombstone, I, I won't be unhappy. <laughs> but I'm not, okay. I'm not promoting it. <laughs> okay. Well, Lee, thank you for joining us today and having this wonderful conversation about architecture, design, and the business side of architecture. It was my pleasure. I really enjoyed it. And that's a wrap. I'd love to get your feedback on today's podcast episode, as well as recommendations for future shows. Reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. Also, if you got value out of to this podcast today, it would mean a lot to get your review over on iTunes. I look at every single review. Now, in today's episode, I asked Lee a provocative question. What advice would he give to firm owners who perhaps feel a little frustrated with not having the money or time they need to do fantastic award-winning work and maybe feel stuck at a plateau. He mentioned several great solutions including teaching, having a side hustle, developing products, or using profitable projects to fund less profitable projects. Now, an option he didn't mention is what we help firm owners do here at Business of Architecture, develop what we call an economic engine to power the practice. You see, teaching, having Hyde Sussel, or as I joked about with Lee, having a trust fund, these are all ways to bring you the financial strength and freedom so that you are free to do the work that you want, how you want to do it. If you'd like to find out how we help firm owners like you build a reliable economic engine that fuels their creative success, you can have a chat with us, you can book a call, just a, this is just a short get to know you call by going to businessofarchitecture.com forward slash call. Me or one of my team members, we look forward to talking to you soon. We'd love to make you our next success story. The views expressed on the show by my guest do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.